All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's a couple minutes after the hour. Um, I know some people are still joining and please feel free to continue to introduce yourself in the chat. It's great to see where everyone is joining from. And I see we have lots of expertise um, related to electronic immunization registries. So that's great to see as well. And you're in the right place. Um, so welcome to our webinar on electronic immunization registries in low and middle income countries. My name is Emily Carnahan um, and I'm a monitoring evaluation and learning manager on Digital Square. Um, Digital Square's mission is to connect health leaders with the resources necessary for digital transformation. And in today's webinar, we're sharing insights from Digital Square's recent report on EIRs. So this report really explores the use of EIRs in low resource contexts and provides recommendations for the design of EIRs. Um, this work was funded by the US Agency for International Development. And I wanna introduce Linda Gutierrez, who has been a great thought partner in this work. So Linda is a senior immunization advisor on the immunization team in the Child Health and Immunization Division Office of Maternal Child Health and Nutrition at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Linda has over 15 years of experience supporting USAID programs in immunization, maternal and child health, and malaria. She serves as the AOR for the Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity Project, or MRITE, which is USAID's flagship project to support strengthening routine immunization systems. Prior to being on the immunization team, Linda worked on the President's Malaria Initiative team and served as the COR for the Malaria Supply Chain and Procurement Project. Prior to working for USAID, she worked at John Snow Inc. on the Immunization Basics Project. She has a master's degree in international development from American University with a concentration in public health. So Linda, thanks for being with us and I'll pass it over to you to say a few words to get us started. Thank you so much, Emily, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you for inviting me to share a few remarks uh, during this exciting discussion about the role electronic immunization registries can play as part of our efforts to strengthen routine immunization programs. Um, I don't think I have to explain this to people, but as we know, routine vaccination is one of the most cost-effective and successful public health interventions. Um, routine immunization programs have evolved and become more complex in the last two decades, and there's been a lot of progress made. However, despite significant gains in the last decade, global vaccination coverage has stalled at 86%, and this has been further disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in 2019, childhood immunization data showed that almost 20 million inf infants were un- or under-immunized. 14 million infants did not receive an initial dose of D uh, DTP, while 6 million were partially vaccinated, but did not complete the required immunization schedule for their first year of life. And a major obstacle to closing the um, vaccination gap is a lack of timely, high-quality data that can better inform planning uh, for immunization services and improve service delivery efforts. Um, as, many, as many of you know, USAID works to save lives and improve the health of women and children, their families and communities. Uh, USAID's maternal and child health programs focus on 25 priority countries across the globe. These countries account for 70% of global maternal and child deaths and immunization is a key pillar for our response for preventing childhood il illness, infection and mortality. USAID has been playing a leadership role in strengthening routine immunization systems and building more resilient systems in, in partner countries through bilateral technical assistance. And uh, since 2001, USAID has helped immunize more than 822 million children and saved more than 14 million lives through the US government's 20 year partnership with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Immunization registries coupled with re reminder systems have been shown to be an effective tool for increasing immunization coverage. Increasingly, primary health care providers are relying upon digital tools to provide data. And electronic immunization registries are replacing the paper-based system of manual record keeping that have been traditionally used by countries. As, as part of USAID's support for strengthening routine immunization, um, sorry, as part of USAID's support for strengthening routine immunization programs, we were interested in understanding 
and building on previous experiences with immunization and other primary care registries, particularly those in low and middle income countries. We wanted to review current and past pilots to summarize the lessons learned from them, what is being done, what worked, what didn't work, and how many uh, and how any challenges were addressed. We were also interested in recommendations on the design of a system that will be able to meet these challenges and be useful for primary care service delivery, uh, service delivery tracking beyond immunization programs. We were also interested in understanding not only how EIRs can support vaccine service delivery during the COVID-19 pandemic, but more broadly as the new global immunization vision and, strat vision and strategy, i.e. 2030 is rolled out in this decade. We were very excited to work with the team at Digital Square uh, on this effort, and we're thrilled to have this opportunity to share the report findings and recommendations. I look forward to today's presentation and discussion on this very important topic. Um, and thank you again for, um, for having me participate. Um, and that's it, uh, over back to you, Emily. Great, thanks so much, Linda. Um, thanks for really framing up the work and I'll just echo Linda's welcome to everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone on the call and see um, everyone introducing themselves in the chat. So again, feel free to continue doing that. And I mentioned at the beginning, but for those who just joined, my name is Emily Carnahan. I'm a monitoring evaluation and learning manager at Digital Square. And I really approached this work um, from a background in immunization and uh, many years at PATH working on electronic immunization registries closely with our PATH teams based particularly in Tanzania, Zambia, and Vietnam. But do wanna acknowledge that I'm approaching this work from Seattle and with a lens of um, implementation, but also a focus on implementation science and research. So as Linda said, this work, we really tried to dig into what's been implemented where and keep the focus um, really on those lessons learned from implementation experiences. So Linda also spoke to this, um, but we had three major aims for this report. We began envisioning this report about a year ago um, and Digital Square in close collaboration with Linda and other colleagues at USAID, as well as um, some close technical collaborators at the CDC, identified these three aims for the report. Um, so first to identify where EIRs have been implemented in LMIC settings and what common systems have been used. Second, summarizing how and why EIRs can add value for vaccination programs. And third, providing recommendations on the functional and non-functional requirements for EIR system design. Um, this report was made available on our website last month. The link is on this slide, but also if you go to digitalsquare.org, you can find it under our list of resources. So I'm going to spend some time um, giving you an overview of what's included in the report. And as we're going, feel free to put comments, questions in the chat. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, and we'll be monitoring the chat for those questions that do come up. But also given you know, the breadth of experience of people on this call, I'm also really interested in your feedback, kind of what, what resonates with you coming out of the report, if there's anything that surprises you, I'm interested to see your comments. I also wanna convey that this work, this report builds on a growing foundation of resources that support the thoughtful development of EIRs. So this includes some really comprehensive guidance documents from PAHO and the European CDC on planning and designing EIRs, um, as well as a recent landscape review of EIRs from Village Reach. In this report, we also highlight the EIR country readiness assessment tool developed by CDC and many partners. That's a really valuable tool for country stakeholders to assess their enabling environment to support an EIR. And then on the right side, also highlighting relevant communities and networks um, that share resources and connect stakeholders to learn from each other about immunization and specifically EIRs. And again, with this report, we're really trying to add to this body of knowledge and capture more of those implementation experiences and lessons learned. So to start, um, I wanna give an overview of the methods. So 
this report was based on a non-systematic review of the literature on EIR implementations in LMIC context. So it was entirely focused on a desk review. Um, we didn't do any primary data collection. And the documents we looked at were wide reaching. So they included peer reviewed literature as well as unpublished literature. Um, on the top right, we've included our uh, document inclusion criteria. So we were looking at documents that fit all of this criteria. So having to include information about registry design, implementation or outcomes. Um, registry was implemented in an LMIC setting. The registry was focused on vaccination or other primary care services. And the document was available in English and published since the year 2000. And so we looked at a wide range of documents and our analysis of those documents was really guided by those three aims that I just walked through um, and the research questions associated with those. We had a predefined coding tree that's available as an annex in our report um, and used Atlas TI software for qualitative coding and then synthesize the results to generate the findings and lessons learned for the report. I do wanna highlight a couple limitations of this approach. Um, so we were relying on existing document review. So we may have an incomplete summary, um, particularly of country progress in implementing EIRs. We might not be capturing more recent EIR introductions or those that have limited documentation that was available. Second, um, another limitation was many source documents describe EIR added value qualitatively, either conceptually or anecdotally, um, and not always with rigorous measurement. So uh, in thinking about summarizing added value, that was a limitation to some studies. And then lastly, um, lessons learned from EIR implementations may not be generalizable to all settings and should be considered with the local context in mind. And I think most people on this call are um, probably have some level of familiarity with EIRs, but wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So EIRs are confidential population-based computerized information systems that record data on vaccine doses delivered. They're designed to capture individualized data, um, the vaccine record for each individual on doses administered by multiple healthcare providers. And the information captured in EIRs can be used um, at many different levels and in different ways, including by providers at the point of service, um, for example, to determine an individual's vaccine schedule and eligibility to make sure individuals receive the right vaccine at the right time. And that individual data can also be aggregated to inform vaccination program monitoring, planning, or forecasting. Historically, um, most LMICs have used aggregate reporting systems for vaccination, where health facilities tally and report the total number of vaccine doses administered, often by key dimensions like antigen and patient, patient age and sex. These are often recorded with paper-based tools at the health facility or other points of service and entered into a digital database at the district level or above. And that's the data flow that you see on the left side of the figure here. Um, and in contrast, EIRs capture digitized information on individual vaccination records. And depending on the system, um, the data captured in the EIR may be entered digitally at the point of service or at a higher level um, and may be accessed at all levels of the health system for use. In recent years, a growing number of countries have embraced EIRs as well as broader health systems digitalization. So this figure is adapted from the WHO Digital Implementation Investment Guide or the DIG, which provides direction on how to design, cost and implement digital health interventions. So the first step should be to identify the health system challenges and needs that you're trying to solve for. So in today's presentation, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, um, about that step, but the report does include a list of the common health system challenges that EIRs are designed to address. And then second is understanding the maturity of the enabling environment for digital health. 
So this is where that EIR readiness assessment tool that I mentioned provides a really useful framework to guide discussions about the enabling environment. Third, the decision on whether to introduce an EIR should be based on those two first steps, um, the enabling environment and the health system challenges. And the EIR should really be designed with those in mind. And it's this step that the report focuses in detail on. Um, so we really discuss EIR design considerations and draw out lessons based on previous country implementation experience. Step four is to implement the digital interventions in line with the national digital health strategy and roadmap, which should be in place as strategic and operational guidance. And then finally, step five is to monitor the implementation and use the data efficiently and for adaptive programming. And these last two steps um, we touch on in the report, but they are a light touch and more of our focus again is on that design of the EIR. But it is really important to acknowledge that the successful implementation and scale up of EIRs does require a well-planned, well-executed rollout um, with considerations for training, change management, community sensitization, ongoing technology maintenance, um, among other implementation factors. So again, our first aim of this report was to identify where EIRs have been implemented in LMICs and what common systems have been used. So we've seen that many countries in Latin America and Asia and an increasing number of countries in Africa are planning, piloting, or scaling EIRs. Um, so again, based on our document review, we found that more than 50 LMICs have implemented an EIR at some scale, including pilot implementations. So this map shows countries that have implemented an EIR. Um, and again, it's at any scale, so this map includes pilots and subnational implementations. Um, you don't see high income countries reflected on this map because they were not part of our review. And the countries here are colored by their digital health maturity level, which is on a scale of one to five, with one being the lowest and five being the highest. And that digital health maturity level is based on the global digital health index. Um, and it measures the maturity of the enabling ecosystem. So for example, lower digital health maturity markets generally lack or have yet to fully implement digital policies. Um, they're more likely to have 2G infrastructure and variable electricity. They might have a workforce with limited digital literacy skills. Um, and in contrast, countries at the higher digital maturity levels generally have digital policies that are enforced, are more likely to have 3G infrastructure and reliable electricity and a digitally literate workforce. So these are aspects of the enabling environment that are important to keep in mind um, to support an EIR introduction or even to inform your choice of EIR system. But we did find that countries across the spectrum of digital health maturity have implemented EIRs. So the majority of LMICs are categorized as levels two or three on this five point scale. And most LMICs that have implemented an EIR are also in those levels two and three. So those are the two shades of blue in this map. Um, level five doesn't show up in this map because all countries that are at that highest maturity level are um, high income countries with the exception of Malaysia where an EIR has not been implemented. And as I noted earlier, um, this is a limitation. This may be an incomplete summary of progress by country, particularly for more recent EIR introductions or those with limited documentation. And this is also a snapshot in time. Um, as we published the report, some countries were beginning to plan for or adopt EIRs for COVID-19 vaccine introductions. The appendix of our report includes country by country um, detail about the EIRs, including references to the source documents for each country, if you want to dig in further. But I think overall this map shows us that there is a lot of interest across LMICs in implementing EIRs and a lot of existing experience uh, to learn from and share across countries. 
So across countries, we also aimed to identify common tools or systems being used as EIRs. And there were four that we saw used across multiple countries. So these were DHIS2 Tracker, OpenMRS, OpenSRP, and Shifo Smart Paper Technology. So DHIS2 Tracker is an extension of the DHIS2 platform, which many countries use as their national health information system. Um, the DHIS2 Tracker enables individual level tracking. It also has a toolkit specifically for COVID-19 vaccine delivery that's aligned to WHO guidance. Open Medical Record System or OpenMRS is a software platform and reference application that enables design of a customized medical record system. And both of these, DHIS2 Tracker and OpenMRS, are digital square global goods, um, meaning they are digital health tools that can be used across different countries and contexts. And we define a mature digital health global good software as free and open source software supported by a strong community, generally funded by multiple sources and designed to be interoperable. Um, they've generally, global goods have generally been deployed at significant scale, used across multiple countries over an extended period of time and have demonstrated effectiveness. Open Smart Register Platform or OpenSRP is another digital square global good that again, another common system we saw across countries. It's a mobile health platform to empower frontline health workers and simultaneously provide program managers and policymakers with current data for decision-making and policymaking. And then lastly, um, Shifo Smart Paper Technology is another tool used for immunization across multiple countries. It's a bit different than the other tools I highlighted um, as it also includes a paper-based tool so health workers record data on smart paper forms, which can be scanned and digitized, um, integrating that data into DHIS2 and generating required HMIS or LMIS reports. Countries considering introducing an EIR um, should consider whether an existing EIR system can be adapted for their context. Leveraging global goods can cut down on fragmentation and duplication and can help to accelerate scale and health impact. Um, and I wanna point out um, these descriptions for the first three of um, DHIS2 Tracker, OpenMRS and OpenSRP come from our Digital Square Global Goods Guidebook, which you can find on our website. And I put a link here under OpenSRP to a case study from the BID initiative on how OpenSRP was used as the EIR platform in Kenya, Pakistan, and Zambia. And it's a great example of how, you know, iterating on an existing open source tool can increase functionality with each implementation while reducing time and cost. Our second aim was to summarize how and why EIRs can add value for vaccination programs. So first I wanna clarify that an EIR's full potential value can only be achieved if it's designed well and implemented effectively. Um, so all the factors here and others can influence the successful design, development and deployment of an EIR, um, as can that broader enabling environment. So acknowledging the many implementation challenges that can arise, um, in this report, we really focus on the potential added value of EIRs for immunization programs. To understand the added value of EIRs, we developed a conceptual framework that you see here to guide the analysis of our document review. So the registry functions, as well as so that includes you know, the design of the registry as well as how it's implemented lead to service delivery outputs. And these service delivery characteristics listed here in our framework um, map directly to the health system challenges found in the WHO classification of digital health interventions. So we use that to inform this framework. Um, and those, those are listed as digital health challenges or chal health system challenges that digital addresses. 
but really in turn, those challenges can help us frame up um, how service delivery changes as a result of implementing a digital health intervention. And then in theory, um, improving vaccination service delivery will lead to improved outcomes, so improved vaccination coverage and equity, and ultimately to improved health outcomes. So for each of those um, components, we summarized what we found from the literature. Um, so EIRs have the potential to add value to vaccination programs in the following ways. So in terms of information, EIRs can improve the quality and reliability of vaccination data, as well as data accessibility and use at all levels of the health system. In terms of availability, EIRs can improve the sufficient supply of vaccine stock, reduce health worker time on data and reporting, which can be put towards patient care, and inform allocation of human resources. So again, can improve the availability of both stock and human resources. In terms of quality, um, EIRs can improve continuity of care and adherence to vaccination guidelines, track vaccine quality issues, better target supportive supervision, and motivate and empower health workers um, to provide higher quality care. In terms of acceptability, um, EIRs can affect the acceptability of vaccination services negatively or positively, depending on whether the community is appropriately sensitized to the EIR. In terms of utilization, EIRs can increase the uptake of vaccination services by improving adherence to vaccine schedules, improving access, and reducing loss to follow up. In terms of efficiency, EIRs can save health worker time on manual paper-based record keeping and can be used for more efficient clinical workflows, data flows, and operational planning. In terms of cost, um, there are upfront and ongoing costs associated with developing and implementing an EIR, which we outline in the report, but EIRs can also result in cost savings, primarily by saving health worker time. And finally, related to accountability, EIRs can improve the health sector's understanding of its client population, provide transparency in vaccine stock transactions, and increase the accountability of health workers by tracking their service delivery. I'm gonna dig a bit deeper into one of these service delivery outputs, um, efficiency, to give you a sense of the level of detail captured in the report. So for each of those service delivery outputs that I just summarized, um, the report goes into a lot more detail. It outlines both the potential added value of EIRs. So in other words, you know, what are all the possible like, theoretical ways that EIRs can improve efficiency? And then we also go into experiences from countries or real world examples to provide evidence or illustrate how these mechanisms play out in practice. Um, so for this example of efficiency, you know, there are many ways that EIRs can improve efficiency of health programs. For example, saving health worker time through automation and reporting, um, reducing revaccination, using mobile devices for data capture can improve efficiency of workflows uh, versus being tied to a desk for data capture or a desktop computer. Um, they can be used for assessing productivity, such as the number of vaccines delivered to target efficiency improvements. Um, they can inform more efficient operational planning and linking data between health information systems. So linking an EIR with a CRVS or an LMIS can also create further efficiencies. So we outline all those ways that efficiency can potentially be improved. And then on the right side, you see some of the experience that we collated from countries. So in this case, related to efficiency, most of the country examples were related to time savings. So for example, those first two bullets um, in Tanzania and Vietnam, studies showed that health workers saved time due to automated reporting with the EIR compared to the legacy paper-based system. And then the last bullet there um, related to another aspect of efficiency, stock management, um, as an example from 
an integrated EIR and LMIS system in Albania um, that suggested more efficient stock management as a result of automated stock forecasting or having the system actually calculate the number of vaccines needed for upcoming months. So this level of detailed information is captured in the report um, for each of those aspects of added value. And then in the report, we also um, dive into the added value of EIRs or the potential added value of EIRs in the context of COVID-19. Um, so in terms of, of how EIRs can support vaccination service delivery in COVID-19 pandemic, um, one way is directly supporting COVID-19 vaccine introduction. So EIRs can be used to capture data about COVID-19 um, vaccine service delivery. So in that way, um, they can be used to identify, you know, which individuals have received vaccines, send reminders for follow-up vaccinations for two-dose vaccines, and monitor any adverse events. Um, however, just to keep in mind, even where EIRs are already in use, they will likely need to be adapted to align with the COVID-19 vaccination strategy and target population. So for example, if an EIR is in place, but is used primarily for childhood routine vaccinations, um, it would need to be expanded to also capture adult populations. Or if new vaccination sites are added for COVID-19, um, new pharmacies, hospitals, long-term care centers, those sites would also need to be added to the system and new, potentially new users um, at those sites may require training or hardware. Um, the second point, EIRs can also be used to monitor the effects of COVID on routine immunization. So EIRs that are in place for routine immunization can help track and understand what areas were hardest hit by interruptions to immunization services as a result of COVID-19. And that feeds into the next um, point there that that information can be used to help plan for supplemental immunization activities or catch-up campaigns. So really quantifying who missed vaccines or the number of children that missed vaccines and highlighting what areas might have been under vaccinated to prioritize for catch up. EIRs um, can also be used for communicating health messages. So many EIRs include contact information and messaging features for direct communication with patients or caregivers. And those messaging features historically are used for sending reminder or recall messages, but in a pandemic context, those messaging features can also be used to share information about the pandemic itself, about how to safely access health facilities or preventive measures to take. And then finally, um, supporting safe immunization practices. So EIRs can also help prevent overcrowding in clinics by scheduling specific clinic times for vaccinations and notifying caregivers. Um, we saw this in Tanzania, the system was adapted and by scheduling patients clinic visits uh, using the EIR, the aim was to have smaller groups and limit the queue and wait times at facilities to help reduce any risk of COVID-19 transmission. Uh, this information about how EIRs can support immunization delivery during COVID and beyond um, is packaged into a short brief that's available on our website alongside the report. And then finally, our third aim was to provide recommendations on the functional and non-functional requirements for EIR system design. So requirements are statements that describe the functionality of an information system and identifying these requirements is really the first step in the software development process. The list of requirements in the report was informed by previous reviews from Village Reach, PAHO, the BID Initiative and other EIR guidance documents. And this report um, adds to those by providing an overview of the common requirements for EIRs but really also highlighting lessons from how those requirements have been operationalized in various contexts. So the functional requirements that we describe in the report um, fall into these six buckets. And functional requirements really describe what the system should do, 
and how end users interact with the system. So there's some requirements re related to registration and search. So the ability to register a child, assign a unique ID, search for and manage clients. Um, there's requirements related to vaccination monitoring and follow-up, which includes monitoring individual vaccine schedules, um, includes embedded clinical decision support that's used to calculate that schedule, and the ability to generate lists of defaulters or individuals due for upcoming vaccinations. There's requirements related to health facility registration and management, so having a complete list of health facilities with the ability to register new facilities, edit that list, um, or remove inactive facilities, as well as the ability to search across the health facility list and, and track or find information about a child regardless of where they go for care. There's requirements related to patient records, capturing demographic data, vaccine event data, caregiver information, and potentially data on other health areas beyond vaccination. Um, requirements related to stock management, including um, tracking vaccine lots and forecasting and planning for stock needs, and requirements related to data and reporting, so having the ability to analyze the data captured in the EIR to generate reports, um, which often includes aggregating data at different geographic or administrative levels to meet reporting requirements. And in terms of non-functional requirements, these describe how the system works. So again, there are six of these we highlight in the report. So they include data exchange and interoperability. So speaking to the need to um, have systems communicate with each other and share data using specified data standards. Offline capability, which is often a really important consideration in LMICs. Um, so having the ability to work without consistent internet connectivity and then syncing the data at a later state. Alignment with international standards and in some cases um, national standards where relevant and these standards can include things like care guidelines, content guidelines, coding standards, etc. Data privacy and security. So again, aligning with standards in that space, um, which may include confidentiality, authentication, audit trail and logs, and user management. Um, planning for scalability and system capacity, um, which can include you know, accommodating concurrent users and deploying across multiple devices and web architecture. And then finally, usability. So making sure the system is designed in a way that's user-friendly, easy to learn, and intuitive for users. And again, um, with each of those functional and non-functional requirements, the report uh, goes into a lot more detail and includes lessons learned for each requirement based on implementation experience in LMIC settings. So again, I'm just gonna zoom in on one requirement, um, the registration and search requirement to give you a feel for the type of lessons that are captured in the full report. So registration and search encompasses requirements related to client management and assigning unique identifiers, as well as enrollment at birth. Um, so some of the types of lessons that we're pulling out related to client management and unique IDs include um, that the home-based record should also capture the unique ID. And specifically um, in the bid initiative context, it was recommended that you know, if the unique ID is a barcode or QR code, there should also be a human readable unique ID that's captured in the EIR that can be written on the home-based record in case of stockouts of those QR or barcode stickers. Planning for community sensitization on unique IDs um, was another lesson. This also came from the bid context where in Tanzania, um, some community members were initially confused or did not trust the barcode stickers and actually removed them from those home-based records. Um, and the lesson there was after health workers communicated the purpose and benefits of the barcodes, there was increased acceptance. Another lesson is in context with multiple potential IDs to consider designing the EIR to capture any relevant ID. 
So for example, Costa Rica's EIR includes a drop-down list of options for what ID to enter. So if, an, if a resident um, you know, is local, a national ID number can be entered, or if they're international, a passport number can be entered. Another lesson is to consider the sustainable supply of materials and equipment to support the choice of a unique ID. So in Tanzania and Zambia, it was challenging to find local vendors that could print barcodes and QR codes in bulk, which was an important consideration for sustainability and cost. Um, and then lastly, designing client search requirements based on health worker workflows and feedback. So um, this was a lesson from Kenya where developing user-centered software based on actual field testing and real workflows allowed for um, quick solving of problems as they arose um, and redesigning as necessary. And then similarly, um, for enrollment at birth, uh, some of the types of lessons there are that the EIR should support registration in the maternity ward with minimum information. So this was a requirement highlighted by the BID initiative because um, many children may be discharged from a maternity ward with incomplete information. Um, in some cases, for example, without an assigned name, and registration should still be possible without that information. Um, in general, it's a best practice to register children as close to birth as possible. That came up across many contexts and helps ensure, you know, every children gets captured in the EIR. Um, linking an EIR to other birth registration systems can improve data quality and achieve better registration coverage. Um, for example, in Chile and Costa Rica, two countries that have high birth registration timeliness and coverage in their civil registries, they're considering linking their EIRs to the civil registration database. And then lastly, um, SMS birth notifications can be used to register home births. So this was a lesson from the BID initiative that um, tested using SMS birth notifications where a village uh, a village leader or volunteer, you know, would send a message to register any home births, but also acknowledging that that can be costly to train and follow up with those community leaders. And even with training, there were sometimes issues with the quality of the information um, and the cost of sending an SMS could be a financial barrier. So uh, the lesson was to selectively target areas that have high home births if you're planning to use that approach. So again, that gives you a sense of the type of lessons that we're drawing out um, and the level of detail related to each of those requirements. And across, when we look across the requirements and all of the kind of operational lessons learned, some of the key themes that were coming out across lessons were um, ensuring that the EIR is acceptable and useful for health workers and aligned to their clinic workflows, uh, which can be achieved with a user-centered design process. Starting with the critical requirements for a minimum viable product, and then taking an agile development approach to iterate and add new requirements over time based on user feedback. We saw this approach taking in quite a few contexts um, and was thought to be successful of really you know, starting, starting with the minimum and then uh, adding to it over time. Also designing the EIR to be interoperable with existing systems. So I mentioned that lesson about linking to birth registries, um, but also making sure it's designed to be interoperable with facility registries, national identifiers, um, logistics management information systems, and others as relevant. Adapting the EIR for the local context and engaging the community involved to understand the health data that are entered into the registry. Um, and that can help address any fears or misconceptions surrounding the digital systems. And then finally, designing the system to be flexible to adapt, change, and scale over time. Um, so including things like, you know, changing the vaccine schedule if a new vaccine gets added, which we're seeing now in the context of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and just making sure that it's designed in a way that is flexible to adapt. So I'll close with some recommendations. So building on the findings in this report, 
um, we recommended the following steps for decision makers who are considering implementing an EIR for the first time. And many of these recommendations also apply to um, improving or expanding existing EIR implementations. So again, first, starting from the vaccination program or health system challenges that you're trying to solve for and whether an EIR may be appropriate to address them. Then if an EIR is determined to be a potential solution, um, using that EIR readiness assessment tool to really understand whether the appropriate enabling environment is in place to support an EIR. Third, if there is sufficient readiness and if that enabling environment is in place, identifying EIR system requirements um, and that's where we really recommend considering some of the operational lessons learned in this report that can help to inform the design of those EIR requirements. Um, also consider whether an existing system or global good can be adapted for your context and recognizing that there are some common systems that we're seeing in use across multiple countries. And then finally, um, design and implement the EIR in line with the National Digital Health Strategy and Roadmap, um, which can help to give that overall vision and context for how the EIR aligns to the overall enterprise architecture. And with that, um, I'll close. It looks like we have about 10 minutes left and happy to take any questions. Um, and as I mentioned, there's also a lot of expertise on this call, so would love to hear about others' experience with EIRs um, and, and what resonated with you from this report. So first, let me, let me check with Anna. I know she was monitoring the chat as we were going through. Um, so Anna, are there any questions that have come up in chat that we should start with? Yes, sorry about that. I need to get myself off of mute. Um, so there's been a couple of really great questions in the chat. And actually, to start with, one from David Brown. Um, given the number of PAHO countries that have implemented EIRs, um, what thoughts do you have on the limitations of only looking at English language uh, reports and things like that? And how might that have affected the analysis of this report? It's a great question um, and definitely is an important limitation. I think a, you know our focus on document review has a few limitations I walked through, but that is a big one that our team, um, our small team who was working on this was limited to looking at English language. Fortunately, there are some really great publications from PAHO um, that are in English and do capture a lot of the breadth of that experience. So that uh, resource I highlighted in one of the early slides um, on the PAHO resource on designing uh, EIRs is very helpful, includes some case studies and spotlights on various PAHO countries. Um, and I know there have been also quite a few peer reviewed publications. So, so we did um, reflect that experience as much as possible, but agree with you, it is, a limitation um, that there, there probably is a lot more detail out there that wasn't available to us, unfortunately. All right, and then um, moving on to some of the questions from Nicola. Um, so it looks like he has some questions just about tablets versus smartphones and other ways of um, potentially using some of these systems, as well as some connections to um, CV CRVS and um, other birth registrations that might be connected in with EIRs. Great. Um, so on the, on the tablet smartphone piece, so that was interesting and surprised me in the multiple ways that that showed up when we were considering added value of EIRs. Um, so I think the, the interesting one to me was how, you know, using a tablet or smartphone or something that is very mobile, how that can have added value um, relative or compared to like a desktop or a laptop. So even within the realm of digital data entry, um, having that mobile ability to actually 
move with that device during the clinic workflows can add a lot of value so that as a health provider, you know, as you're seeing uh, a child for routine immunizations, you can have that in hand and be entering data, but then you can also benefit from the clinic clinical, you know, decision support prompts that that is giving you in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're entering a child's weight and they're underweight, kind of giving you some prompts for how to, how to address that. Um, and then I think there's also a lot of considerations around which tablet or smartphone to use and making sure that it's something that is um, available in the local context and you know can be fixed or replaced easily in the local context. Um, I think that's a challenge sometimes in, in you know, shipping devices from overseas and it's not as sustainable of an approach. And then on the second part of that question, CRVS and linking to birth registration, there was a lot of interesting examples there um, and we highlighted them in the report about the benefits of linking systems, but really that it can go in both directions. So sometimes, you know, immunization can be the first interaction with uh, the health system and can, can be a venue to prompt children to get registered in the CRVS. And in other countries, um, it's the opposite. If there's really high birth registration in a CRVS system, that can be used to then identify children not being captured for immunization and encourage them um, to, to follow up with their immunizations. So interesting to see how it can go both ways, um, but uh, definitely a lot of benefits in linking the systems to see if children are being captured in one and not the other, and to have you know standardized information across individuals in the target population. All right, and then um, one from Peter Breitenbach of just getting a sense of how many of the EIRs that you identified in low and middle income countries are currently active and have scaled to support national EPI programs. It's a great question. Um, that is the map that we showed. I really tried to emphasize that, that not all of those implementations have scaled. So you probably picked up on that. Um, uh, there is you know, a subset of them that have been scaled, even among the ones that have not been, many of them are endorsed by the National EPI program with the intent to scale. Um, but it's, it's a range across countries. Unfortunately, I don't have, you know, exact numbers to give you. Um, but in the report in our annex, when we kind of go, um, there's a country by country list that gets at some of that scale information where we have it, um, but we didn't have it consistently across countries to, to be able to look at that consistently. But I would say um, the PAHO countries, uh, many of the PAHO countries, maybe most of the PAHO countries are scaled at a national level, um, whereas there are very few um, in the Africa region that have scaled nationally. Great, and related to that, there's another great question about um, what lessons you found about phasing in and scaling up EIRs and how that interacts with existing paper-based systems, if there's any findings around that. Yeah, that's um, another great question. So our review focused more on kind of the design of the EIR and less, less emphasis on kind of the implementation approaches and scale up, but we um, did come across a lot of information about that concurrent use of the EIR and paper-based systems or kind of parallel use of systems. And that often is a real challenge when systems are first being introduced um, because in a lot of contexts, they are introduced in parallel. And initially, you know, there might be this double data entry burden on healthcare workers where they're expected to still fill out the paper-based legacy forms, but then at the same time are expected to use the digital system. Um, so I think a, a best practice or recommendation there is just from the outset to have really clear, have a really clear transition plan um, and 
and guidelines or milestones to inform when that transition happens to go completely to using the digital system. And just recognizing that in the short term, you know, that can put a lot of burden on, on healthcare workers if they're expected to do that parallel data entry. So that should, the time for that should be minimized however possible. Right. Well, there are a few more questions in the chat, Emily, but given time, um, I think we can take some of these offline and can do some follow up with folks who have additional questions. So I wanted to give you just a minute or two for any concluding thoughts um, and wrap this up. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. And yes, very happy to connect offline um, following the webinar. And we'll also, we've been recording this webinar. It'll be posted on our website along with the, the report. Um, we also, I mentioned, have one summary brief on the website about COVID-19 and EIRs um, and two more short briefs coming that focus on the requirements um, to give, again, a summary snapshot of those as well as on the recommendations. Um, so thanks to everyone for your time and for joining. and. Yes, happy to be in touch with any follow-on questions. Thank you.